It's been said that the most powerful weapon on earth is the human soul on fire. As we know, passion drives all human progress. Political breakthroughs, medical, technology. Unfortunately, though, so many of us, when we talk about passion, put an asterisk next to it. In other words, like, passion as long as it's convenient. What I would encourage you to do today and to think about is unleashing your passion combined with another P word, persistence. Because when you put those two together, remarkable accomplishments can be achieved. Last November, my partners and I launched Detroit Venture Partners. Dan Gilbert, Brian Hermelin, and I set out on a crazed mission to help rebuild Detroit through entrepreneurial fire. We felt that by investing in seed and early stage tech companies and backing passionate entrepreneurs, we could create jobs, urban density, and hope. You think about the impact that a couple, a couple venture-backed companies made on Seattle. Starbucks and Microsoft not only created jobs, but they set that entire region on a trajectory of success. Groupon will have a similar impact in Chicago. And we're ready to make right now Detroit's defining moment. Now, because we followed our passion, it allowed us to attract an incredible new partner. Mr. Irvin Magic Johnson could invest his money anywhere. I'm sure any VC would love to be hooked up with this guy based on his track record of success, both on and off the court. He brought his magic here to the D. And it wasn't because we promised him untold riches or fame or glory. It was because we set out to make a difference. Now together, the four of us believe that we put our passion first and we follow impact and the money simply comes as a byproduct. What's your North Star? Those that greedily chase cash seldom find it. But those that pursue passion with persistence are the ones that are enabled to do well and do good at the same time. Simply put, passion leads, money follows. Scientists, you know, does everyone know what a pike is? It's like this really angry freshwater predatory fish. You know? All right. So scientists take a huge tank, and on the one end they put a pike, other end, they put lots of little fish that that pike would just love to eat. But in the middle, they insert a glass divider. Now here's what happens every time this experiment is conducted. Pike sees the fish, goes over, bam, smashes into the glass. Doesn't get the fish. Goes back and tries it again. After a couple dozen times of not reaching his goals, that pike lingers at the bottom of the tank. It's frustrated and disappointed. Well, next, the scientists remove the glass divider. So you'd think that pike is going to have the feast of his life. But he doesn't. Lingers at the bottom of the tank. Well, those little fish start to get brave. They swim right in front of that pike's nose. Again, you would think, huge feast, everything is great. But instead, every time this experiment is conducted, that pike lingers at the bottom of the tank and dies of starvation. Let's refer to this as the Pike Syndrome. The Pike Syndrome. Which is letting an imaginary barrier get in the way of progress. Well, as we know, this doesn't just apply to fish. It applies to all of us. We tell ourselves all these things. I'm not smart enough. I'm not old enough. I'm not young enough. I didn't go to the right school. I didn't grow up in the right area. I don't have the right connections. Quick story. There's a kid named Joseph Hudica. He's eight. Joseph has been named the little entrepreneur. He invented this game called Pucks, P-U-C-K-Z. And it's a downloadable app in the Apple app, you know, the app store. It's a cross between checkers and hockey. Anyway, this kid, who's eight, is selling thousands a day for 99 cents a piece. You didn't go to the right college. This kid didn't go to the right middle school. <laughs> but he's not letting his imaginary barriers get in his way. And neither can we. Two-thirds of the world's billionaires are self-made. 
They had the same imaginary barriers that all of us, but somehow they had both the passion and the persistence to overcome those obstacles, bust on through, and seize the day. I've had the privilege of being an entrepreneur for 20 years. And at the age of 20, I'm 41 now, I guess 21 years, I started my first company. I had this idea, and I had to figure out how to get it done. At the time, computers were becoming you know, very popular. This was 1990. But you couldn't just go run out to Best Buy or order one from Dell at the time. They were kind of hard to come by a discount computer. Being a tech nerd, I had this idea that I could buy individual components, assemble them in my college apartment, sell them for a discount, and still undercut the competition while making a profit. Now the problem is, I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never started a business. I'd never even taken a business class. So what I did was, I went to my mentor. This was a man I'd looked up to, He'd run his own business for over 20 years. So I went and I shared my idea, shared my passion, explained what I was hoping to do, and humbly asked for a $1,000 loan to pursue my dream. He said, share with me your business plan. I was like, a what? That's to be good advice. I went to the library. Anyone remember libraries, by the way? I went to the library to figure out what he was talking about. So I learned what a business plan was, and I decided to write the granddaddy of them all. My finished product was nearly 100 pages of charts and graphs and figures and examples. I ran over to Kinko's, I printed it on beautiful paper, I put it in a nice binder, and I mailed it off to my mentor, eagerly awaiting his feedback. Now I was on pins and needles. And I was expecting to hear praise and admiration. But what I heard instead was quite disturbing. That's a terrible idea. It will never work. What the hell do you know about running a business? I can't loan you $1,000. That would be irresponsible. You will fail. Now those words stung. But they stung all the more because that man was my father. The man I looked up to my whole life had just doomed me to fail, except defeat. But something inside me said to forge ahead, passion and persistence. I scraped up some money by playing jazz gigs, I maxed out my credit cards, I launched this business and I never looked back. I made tons of mistakes. But somehow, again, through passion and persistence, I sold that business for a healthy profit just before completing my undergraduate degree. Whatever your dreams are, there will be no shortage of people to tell you that it can't be done. The detractors will show up in droves, the naysayers, to test your resolve, and it's up to you to ignore that. My own father told me I would fail. Never relinquish the power of your own dream to the fear of another. So I'm a Detroiter, a hardcore Detroiter you might say. And I think about Detroit and think about the metaphor that that could apply to, to us all. I mean Detroit's kind of like the Rocky Balboa of cities. It's fighting for glory and survival. The first chapter of our region it was all about creativity and entrepreneurship. It was about passion and persistence. Folks like Henry Ford put us on the map through creativity and breakthroughs and ideas and change. And because of that, our city prospered and our region thrived. We built roads, we built hospitals, we built you know, universities, beautiful buildings. We were the Silicon Valley of the United States. This was the place for opportunity. This was the place for entrepreneurship. This was the place for creativity. The chapter two, also known as the Dark Ages. Instead of all that creativity and innovation, we flipped. We built stifling bureaucracies. 
We came entrenched with finger pointing and protectionism and blame. We started to manage costs and control human resources. We stopped innovating, we stopped creating, and we stopped winning. For decades, our region crumbled. And we ended chapter two as a national punchline, spinning with hopelessness and despair. Which is now where we are, chapter three. This chapter itself is unfinished, and it's up to all of us to decide how it's going to go. We can keep doing what we've been doing for the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Point fingers, cast blame, or damn it, we can do something about it. We can seize this moment. We can make it our defining opportunity to thrive on the world stage. We can run, once again reclaim Southeast Michigan as a beacon of innovation and creativity, of passion, of purpose, of persistence. It's up to us. Each of us can make that difference. Each of us can make a personal choice whether we're going to do what we've always been doing and no doubt at least see the same results or worse, or we can seize it. We can become that force. We can personify innovation. There was a man named Robert Desnos. Desnos was a prisoner in Auschwitz. 1945, World War II. Now, this guy had been in the concentration camps for quite some time. Imagine his life. Every day you wake up, hungry, scared, hopeless. Well, that one fateful day, the guards came and gave him the nod. He'd been around for a while and he knew what this meant. This was the day that he and his fellow prisoners were to be marched to their death. So these people gathered quietly, walked outside in the courtyard, about to proceed with this horrific march to the gas chambers. Out of nowhere, though, Desnos looked down at the woman sitting, standing next to him, grabbed her hand, and said, Ma'am, may I read your fortune? She didn't have much to lose, so she said, okay. So she looks, he, he looks into her hand and says, ma'am, I see long life and happiness. Well, a man overhears and says, well, read my fortune. Grabs his hand and says, I see lots of business success. Read my fortune, read my fortune. This crowd, literally in the worst moment of their lives, starts to emerge with, with, with hope and energy. What could be going on here? Now the guards didn't know what to do. They had never seen anything like it. Was it a trap? Was it a trick? What's going on? How could these people be dreaming about the future when their fate had already been sealed? Read my fortune, read my fortune. Because those guards didn't know what to do, they sent this group of people back to the barracks until they could figure it out. As I mentioned, this was towards the end of the war. Robert Desnos' act of creativity, of passion, of persistence, saved the lives and legacies of 200 people that day. Desnos did in his darkest moment. Think what you can do in your finest. All of us have an opportunity right now, right here today. We can follow the herd, do what we're told, play it safe, and you end up playing it safe only to learn that playing it safe has become the riskiest move of all. Let's make this our defining moment. Let's make this your defining moment. Through passion and persistence, through creativity and innovation, we can win. We can rebuild this region. We can create untold success, personally, families and communities. And all of us together have the opportunity right now to change the world. Thank you.